Good morning. Welcome back to the Digital Dialogues and the latest in our one-to-one -one series. I'm joined today by Jenny Matthews, founder or co-founder of She of the Sea. Jenny, thanks so much for being with us. Amazing. Always love having these conversations. Thanks so much for creating the space to have them. No, that's what we're here for. I'm really looking forward to, to speaking to you today because I had a very interesting read of, a, of, of your annual report around diversity and inclusion in, in the superyacht industry. And, and you know, former crew myself, I spent you know, seven, eight years at sea and, and I've seen some really great things and I've seen some, you know, not so great things. And I think some of that was reflected in, in some really interesting and some shocking figures there. And, and something you highlighted to me was that, that a lot of the the key thing with Shared the Sea and, and the foundation is putting people back at the centre of the industry. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Love it. Yeah, I think, you know, people have been a passion of mine since, you know, as a teenager. And I think when we look at why this conversation of diversity and inclusion actually matters is, you know, it's really important to work out why we want to go somewhere before we just start making a plan to go there. Mm -hmm. And when we really look at this is, why do people matter? Why do they need to be at the centre? It might sound a little bit dramatic, but essentially our future as an industry depends on it. You know, this is mm -hmm. a conversation that involves and impacts every single stakeholder. You know, whether that is crew, that is the, you know, there's very diverse in itself, uh, shoreside community, the owners, and of course, this next generation of talent. So I always like to kind of frame it that there, there's two reasons why people do and should care about this, why being people. And, you know, one is becoming more and more prevalent now, this, and that is the moral and ethical reason. You know, do we as an industry want to work in an environment that has, you know, discriminatory practices, uh, a very undiverse uh, workplace, and, uh, you know, a churning of talent, this real, like, leak of knowledge? Uh, mm -hmm. And... What we're seeing with people engaging uh, with our platform and in the wider conversations that in the world, uh, the answer is becoming increasingly no, you know, <laughs> and that is because, you know, either people are themselves previously excluded demographics in terms of genders, race, or orientations, or they have a loved one. You know, we see a lot mm -hmm. of um, men really, you know, involved with what we're doing because they've got daughters. And they know the industry and they want them to work in it because who wouldn't? It's amazing. And they want it to be better for their daughters. So they, those are that's one major reason. Mm -hmm. And the other one is becoming is completely data-backed and also is even more universal, is that our ability to perform and achieve our goals is 100% dependent on the team who's on the tools and the environment in which they're working on. And that doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether your goal is you know, uh, commercially focused, whether you're a business or you want to build the most fantastic yachts or or if it's more impact focused, let's look at, you know, Rev Ocean or the mm -hmm. Water Revolution Foundation. These are some of the biggest issues facing our, our world. If we're not focusing on who's in the team and how they can operate, how on earth are we going to reach our goals? So can't really argue with that one. <laughs> and that's why this is so exciting. It's such an easy, it's such a kind of a an obvious uh, conversation and that's why I have so much fun talking about it yeah and I, I think there's that perception that that you know I find frustrating um, that the the team on board and the prejudices on the board and the discriminatory practices in the hiring and and is is an old thing it's old school and to one hand, on one hand, it is a little ossified in the past, but on the other hand, you still do see it, and and, and it is it is really unfortunate. And I think there's a, as you have highlighted, there's a big you know cost you know trade off there, and in, in not recruiting the best talent, and not having the best people on board, and we really have to break that mold, and it kind of starts early on, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think I always like to, you know, we can all get really excited about these things and be like, it's so obvious, like, let's let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's make change now. But I think we also have to put in context, you know, the maritime industry is, you know, arguably one of the oldest industries in the world. You know, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And also in the context of our industry itself, you know, like I've got friends who've been in the industry since, you know, as much of day one as there could be. And they're laughing. They're like, it's so funny that we call ourselves an industry. You know, that this growth is fairly recent for us. So we're still working out what a professional industry looks like for us. And it's very mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we are, I mean, I, you guys already shared my uh, uh, anecdote, you know, the, that we're this awkward teenager. So we are in our growth phase, but it's important that we set the groundwork now as opposed to try and unpick it in two, uh, 10 years, 20 years when it's too late. You know, we've already, we're already suffering for, for our inaction now. And does that involve perhaps detaching ourselves a little bit from that maritime history? Because sometimes I feel that we, we pick and choose the elements of maritime history and, and, and tradition that, that, that the super yacht industry would like to adapt. And, but in many ways, we're, we're a lot more dynamic. Mm. You mentioned things like Rev Ocean. We, 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 we draw upon so many different areas that maybe we need our own kind of foundation that, that we build on. I love that. And I think, you know, what's really coming up for me when you share that is that, I mean, ashore, a, a it's very, you know, like there there is a, multiple industries within that, mm -hmm. industry, you know. But when we talk about the seafaring side, we're actually a hybrid. We are as much a service industry as we are a maritime industry. So we're already a mm -hmm. hybrid. And they're also, fun. I mean, there's obviously the charter aspect to this. The goal of the yacht is more based on experience as opposed to profit and turnover. I mean, obviously that mm -hmm. element is there because there's, there's money involved, but you know, the, this is a very unique landscape. And I think the sooner that we are, you know, not afraid to do things differently, if that means doing them better, that's mm -hmm. the carve out our, our identity that is unique to us because we are unique and we're fascinating. And you now the whole world is looking at what we're going to do. We've got this amazing opportunity here. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's as you're saying that, you know, opportunity is one thing and, and I, I'm also remembering some of my own experiences where, like, you know, charter is certainly one thing. The experience, I think, is another. Mm -hmm. um, so we're tied in with the maritime history and, you know, as, you know, as a deck officer, there's obviously a lot of that that you need to remember, um, but across all aspects of, of, of on board. But, you know, sometimes in a charter you'll spend, as you can attest to, I'm sure, you know, you spend some time driving the boat, then you spend some time uh, being a pretty full-time carer for the boss's kids. Then you spend other time kind of setting up whole experiences for, for families. And these involve massively different skill sets. Um, as well as, you know, driving a boat. So, you know, that's one aspect of it. But we really need diverse, you know, skilled, uniquely talented people to do this. And just kind of rehashing some of the older skills really, I don't think it's going to cut it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is also worth, you know, if we're going to uh, acknowledge our, our salty maritime roots, if we look at what's happening in the, you know, the traditionally commercial maritime industry, they're, they are, I mean, they're a lot bigger. I always, again, mm -hmm. I love a good analogy. <laughs> you know, they are, in an essence, a huge tanker. They've got a huge turning circle. If they want to move how their industry operates, it's going to take a long time because they're so huge. They're so international. But they have already been working on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. inclusion. It's all through the IMO. You know, I mean, from all levels, big, small, Maritime UK in the US, all over the world has been doing this for a while now. We are behind the mm -hmm. ball. But the advantage that we have is like a super yacht, we don't have the turning circle like that. We are young, we are agile, we are so interconnected that we have an opportunity here. You know, we are behind the eight ball here, but we have the opportunity to make real change a lot quicker than these other larger industries. I like that analogy, definitely. You know, you, we <laughs> might... <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's a really you know, important point. Um, and I think perhaps like your your report highlighted, um, there's a need to perhaps start with recognition of the facts. You know, anecdotal evidence is one thing, saying, you know, I experience yachting in this way or I experience, oh, no, it's okay because I experience it in this way. Yeah. doesn't really work, you know, and if we want to be dynamic and, and make these decisions, it, it needs to be based on you know, these are the facts. Yeah, we need to implement something. Absolutely, data is essential for any meaningful change to be made. Uh, and one of my favourite quotes, the Einstein quote: "If you've got an hour to solve a problem, he'd spend fifty-five minutes defining the problem, so the solution would only take five minutes." So, um, I really value the personal stories, the anecdote. You know, these are the things that people connect with on an emotional level. They mm -hmm. often first buy in and they also add the human element, you know, that human side to the conversation. 
but to really understand what the challenges are um, collectively as a system, as, a, as an ecosystem, to really understand those challenges and then define strategies that actively and, you know, dynamically address those challenges and then to be able to monitor, report, you know, this is not just a tick box exercise. We need to have a system in place to create real change. And also my other favorite words, transparency and accountability. It's one thing mm -hmm. to say that something's doing, you're going to do something, but to actually back that up is essential. You can't really have one without the other. Then when you mention accountability, there's often that, well, I think sometimes an overused uh, rationale against implementing change, mm. which is that the owner doesn't want it, you know, and I think it's sometimes used as a uh, a coverall for, for, for not, you know, and people say, well, you know, the owner, there's a difference towards the owner. Yeah. And it is at the end of the day, they pay, pay our salaries and they pay the for the vessel. But I think that's perhaps overused. But yeah. is that the problem or is what is your experience and from your conversations in this regard? I love this conversation. Um, so I think it's first important to acknowledge that there is a chunk of the owners that have very specific requests about who they want on board. Mm -hmm. We've been in the industry, we know this, you know, the jobs descriptions, you know, six foot blonde parasol and look alike, you know, literally seen these requirements coming out, or whatever it might be for the males as well. Let's acknowledge that this is not yeah. always gender specific. So we need to acknowledge that that is there. But for them, and just that's okay. But because that section is there, and let's say in the, in the vast, you know, of all of the owners, that is a minority. Mm -hmm. Most of the owners, they, first of all, are trusting us to have their best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. They're not telling us what to do. You know, they, they're not telling us how to, do, to, to run our industry. It's our responsibility to provide them, look after their best interest. Mm -hmm. They also haven't become rich by accident. And a lot of the people that are involved in business know intimately they're doing it in the business. They expect this of us. It is 2021. Diversity, equity, mm -hmm. inclusion is so intimately tied to performance that it is embedded into tech, finance, business, VC funding, the whole lot, investment. You know, they're probably thinking that we're already doing it. <laughs> you know, uh, they, they understand why this is important. And if we look at what their um, what value looks like there to them, they want to have an amazing time on their yacht. Mm -hmm. They want to know that the crew on board is looking after their 40, 80 million euro asset. And they mm -hmm. want to know that the family is safe mm -hmm. when they're on board. Now, if we cannot hand on heart say that we are hiring for competency and performance as opposed to what someone looks like, how mm -hmm. can we say that we are looking after their best interests? But it's really simple. Mm -hmm. And that create, and I think that hiring practice not laying the blame at, at, at recruiters or, or any one in partic particular part of the industry, but that creates a negatively kind of feedback loop yeah. cycle, really. You know, and I think breaking that and, like you say, the experience on board is the key, and if we can lift that from the yeah. crew mess right the way up to, to, to the guest areas, and that's yeah. key. And when we look at like we're, we're, I mean, I know that you guys have all the stats, and I wish I'd actually asked you this beforehand. We look at the percent, you know, all of the billionaires and millionaires in the world. What percentage own yachts? Mm -hmm. And how do those people uh, continue to own yachts? You know, like we are, we our major stakeholder is a very, very small population on this earth. We should be absolutely putting them at the centre of everything we do because there's not that many to choose from, right? No, you're right, and but also the the, the the next generation of owners is yeah. increasingly diverse, you know, yeah. and the, you know, we have a little, a little, a little system that's that's fed itself for for a long time and very effectively. But it's a, it is a niche. It's a sector of a sector. It, it, if if we look at the full potential uh, for, for for ownership and, and use and engagement across the yeah. world, so really, unless we start, you know, developing these systems in a diverse way now, we're yeah. going to be behind the eight ball later on. And, you know, it's as much about, like, capturing a bigger share of the market and it's also about, like, um, trying to keep uh, the current owners wanting to have yachts. I mean, again, I feel like this is probably data that you might have, but how many 
yacht owners get sick of crew turnover, different faces on board, unnecessary damage, you know, avoidable, hugely expensive damage to their asset. You know, these things are all experience um, that we don't want them to have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to have, love their boat, love the people, come on board, have an amazing time, and then buy another boat in five years. You know, that's what mm -hmm. we want. Um, so are we doing everything that we can to ensure that that experience is the one that they have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this we're creating barriers to ourselves. I think in many yeah. respects, you know, and I think if we if there's if we want to be treated as a like you say as a as a professional industry, mm -hmm. if we look at the rate of change across all industries at the moment. Um, you really don't want to be left behind in this kind of accelerated, you know, catching up. And it's a catching up. It's still not back to where it should be. You know that. It's not like we're anyone's bounding ahead. Everyone's pretty much catching up to where they need to be, and, and we're even further behind in that respect. When you look at some of the facts, I mean, these are fairly well publicised figures. Um, but you know, ninety-seven point nine percent of captains are men. You know, that's a figure that, that I mean, that's nineteen fifties boardroom kind of stuff. Mm. That that you know, as a benchmark, is I mean, that's it's crazy. You know, and even head chefs, even head chefs as well, chefing famously, yep. like the famous disparity there across all restaurants. We've even managed to best that. You know, I think that's about seventy percent for, for for restaurants. Yachting even beats that up to eighty five percent. So, you know, we are behind the eight ball, which is already behind. And do you know what? This is what I love about data. When I saw that the the galley department statistics. I was floored and I looked at Tash, who's also a chief officer, and we were like, what on earth? And then we talked to one of our chef friends and they're like, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is also the like, if you're not directly in, impacted by this, you often don't know that these are issues. And this is why collecting this data is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think so. I think it's, it's and then implementing the, 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 steps to kind of move past it. Who do you think the key kind of drivers for this are? Obviously, we all need a level of involvement, but yeah. what's that next step, you think? Who, who's the one that you think can really kind of take the ball and run with this? Great question, and it's one that everyone everyone's like, right, whose responsibility is this to fix Well, I would, responsibility, I think, is a strong word. No. I think who's the best positioned to kind of jump on this yeah. right now? And uh, the answer I'm going to give you is probably not the one that you might expect or want. Sure. <laughs> and, um, unfortunately, well, or is it me? Um, it is going to take a absolutely collaborative effort across all sectors of our industry to even sure. take the first step. So, uh, and the first step for what we found from our report is that. So uh, one of the pledge commitments, so the reason that people were contributing data is because they signed our diversity and inclusion pledge, and one of the, the resolutions was to contribute data. Mm -hmm. Without data, we can't even begin to make a roadmap. And what we found when it was time to collect that data was that 33% of our signatories, we had 27 signatories, only 33% of those signatories could contribute the data required for the report. Now, that is a complicated issue that is around GDPR, that is how the data is being collected, where mm -hmm. it's being collected, if it's even being collected. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the data that we were able to collect only really looked at two genders. We could find we weren't able to share any information about race, ethnicity, orientation, age, all of these things. So our first step, our first milestone is to get our industry, uh, you know, standard industry practice to collect and share data. Mm -hmm. Without that, we don't have a, a, a you know a hope in hell. <laughs> so yeah, that is from the shipyards to the crew agents to the training providers, you know, and that is uh, needs to include the shoreside and the seafaring. And you know what? If we can get some information on owners as well, then that's going to add an even more you know robust aspect to this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I think well, I mean, it's not coincidental that the the the, the sentiments around this are, are really accelerating as we are becoming more connected. You know, there's mm. that idea that the boat's a black box that, that, that comes in every now and then and rotates crew is, is, is not true anymore. People are connected and they can voice their opinions and, and feel like there's a way that's not necessarily through the captain or the GPA. Mm. They've got that connection and that ability. 
so really we we we've got the the platform in place yeah. and, and if the the will is there then we can get that data and we you know we can overcome this and you know what it's almost poetical really and that if you look at it as a, as a challenge we need a diverse group of people in an inclusive environment to solve this huge problem. And that's exactly what, diver what She of the Sea and Legacy is doing. How on earth do we make the Subio industry diverse and inclusive? That's a huge task. It's complicated. Let's get a diverse mix of people, create a platform where we can have everybody's knowledge shared and create a solution that we can report and monitor on. You know, it's, it's, it's almost beautiful. The, the, the process of solving the problem solves the problem and i think yeah, just yeah. like perhaps back to that einstein analogy that the, the 95 percent of the time we spend putting the pieces in place and then yeah. the rest kind of falls into in, in line exactly and so a lot of the work that we're doing is involving obviously the people that are in position to create change you know at ceo level from all you know like i said shipyards law firms uh, management companies and then we've got the seafarers but it's also involving this next generation you know, mm -hmm. what do you want to see? What are your challenges? And so we're creating this beautiful, rich, circular knowledge economy that goes top to bottom, bottom to top, left to right, you know, it gets everybody uh, working together towards a common goal that we all benefit from as well. You know, we're making a bigger cake. We're not just going for a bigger slice. <laughs> and uh, apart from having that kind of diverse, like stratified level, like kind of system where we've got representation at all layers, which obviously is the end goal. Um, but what do you see perhaps between now and then, you know, in the short term, short to medium term, you know, what kind of system would like you like to see in place, for example, on board a yacht, um, in terms of how that communication might actually work and, and, and what you see as those, those next kind of steps and your ideal kind of situation. We talk about communication, we talk about perhaps having an app that you can report these things on, but what does that look like in the short term? Uh, really good question. I think because you've mentioned uh, on a vessel, should I talk about a vessel? Yeah, that's just a vessel as a microcosm for the whole industry, shall we say. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting about the vessels themselves is that the shoreside industry is really loving this. Like there's so much engagement from there. On board the vessels, you've got to remember they're very isolated. You would remember um, your time on board, you know. Mm. You're not even really aware of what's happening in the broader thing. You might not, you might know about diversity and inclusion, you probably don't. <laughs> you know, so the first kind of the milestones that we have to that are commonly followed is really firstly about um, education, awareness, visibility. And that uh, again is a trickle-down effect. So, you know, when you join a vessel, there is, you know, we value a, you know, we are creating an XYZ culture. This is what this behavior looks like. This is what is mm -hmm. expected of you. This is what we will not tolerate, you know, and that's not just a kind of a tick box exercise, which it can be now. And that is instilled from the management company. The captain is aware and understands why it's important, <laughs> you know, so it's not like, oh, we have to do this because I've been told to, but really that education about why it matters. Yeah, not just that. I mean, I remember when I, yeah, everyone remembers their first day on board and mm -hmm. you get given this pile of paperwork and it's almost expected that you're not going to read it. It's like, take the paperwork, have a flip through, sign an initial, and maybe one of those pages is about don't be, um, don't be a horrible person. Uh, yeah. And yeah. you initial it and then you're away, you know, like, so what you're talking about is, you know, proper, um, you know, yeah. especially yellow young people coming and joining is actually sitting down and talking through this stuff and yeah. like a two way engagement. Like, you know, we've got a zero, toler a zero uh, tolerance policy on racism, sexism. Mm -hmm. this is what is expected? This is what's not. These are the consequences. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of the reason that um, discriminatory behavior occurs is because there is absolutely co no consequence for doing mm -hmm. it. <laughs> you know, and to take that in a corporate setting, you can imagine, and you've probably seen it, what happens at sea. Oh. Totally different. <laughs> yeah. So it's, a, it's this balance between policy and practice. That's how mm -hmm. change is created. It's having the policies in place. It's having the practices that create the consequences and model mm -hmm. behavior. So it's mm -hmm. those, those two kind of syner synergistic aspects. And that feeds up, right? Like the, the, if you learn this earlier on, and also, I mean, this is making a generalization, but I think the next, the next generation of people coming through yeah. have a different tolerance than than even than even we did without aging us particularly but um us with one level and then the and then the captains before us are on another level 
Yeah. And and I and but I noticed my young the younger generation below me, my nieces, my nephews, they expose so many of my, you know, un my like subliminal almost prejudices. Yeah. And I think if that generation's coming through, they're not going to accept some of this stuff, oh. you know. And and we 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 will embarrass ourselves by not addressing it. And and they're the ones that will lay the, the future platform. I mean, honestly, there's so many topics that we can talk about, but that is such a huge one, and we're already seeing it. And this is where we are getting into a slippery slope here. There mm -hmm. are people already, you know, they've been in the industry for two years, and they're like, "Why on earth is this?" Like, it's it's not shock; it's more like confusion. Like, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. why, obviously, I'm not going to work in this environment because this is completely unacceptable. I'm going to go and take my talent and my passion and my innovation to another industry. And it's just we've got this reverse filtering process happening now that the people that will stay will be the section of that next generation that are like going to tolerate pretty mm. discriminatory behavior. And it's like, do we want the bright minds of tomorrow that are forward thinking and going to be able to create the solutions and the experiences that will drive our industry? Or do we want the people that are just like, yeah, all right, that sounds fun to me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, what, what tier do we want to be pulling our talent from? And those aren't the, and those aren't the people that will inspire the owners that will inspire the captains that will really move the in yeah. industry forward. You know, that's, that's where we get stuck in that little negative status quo that I don't yeah. think anyone wants or needs. So that's our decision now is uh, what talent will, you know, be the face of our industry in 10, 20 years. And we get to make that decision today. And I sincerely hope we make the right one because I shudder to think what the industry could look like if, if we don't. Again, without being dramatic. But no, but we need it. You know, that's, yeah. that, yeah, there's no point in in, in you know, skirting around the issue because it is existential, really. Uh, if we want to, you know, we, we can move, we can chug along, but if we want to really move it forward, yeah, I think this is a massive part. And it, uh, just as a little kind of finisher on that little topic is that it is widely acknowledged and uh, becoming increasingly urgent conversation is that is maritime even an attractive career for the next generation? And this is the answer from the commercial world is we've got a real problem here. So it's the, the seafaring shortage crisis and there is a lot mm -hmm. of people now and really, you know, this is part of the reason for diversity and inclusion is that if we want people to, to run this industry and, you know, propel this industry, if we're only looking at a very, very slim, let's be honest, in, in, the, in certain roles, you know, like white male, if we're only looking at this section of the talent pool, as opposed to as wide as we can, we're really just doing ourselves a disfavor because we're, you know, we're just we're, we're only looking at the small section. So it's also another element to bring in. No, I think so. Well, Jenny, that's been a fantastic conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed that. And like you said, there were so many more topics that we could go down, and, and I hope we will in the future. But I think if anyone has it has the time, I highly recommend reading the full Chief of the Sea report, which we will link to um, in the story accompanying this conversation because it makes for some vital, sometimes shocking reading, but uh, I think it's it's a really good way to get engaged with this, get engaged with Jenny and the team at Chief of the Sea as well. So thanks again for being with us. Amazing conversation, and uh, we look forward to speaking again. Amazing. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure.